Yeah, so I'm going to present some results from a pilot study we did in walking perturbations uh, in people with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD for short. And now I can't find it, there we go. So very briefly, um, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, it's the second most common respiratory disease behind asthma, um, affecting about 2% of the population. Um, and this is associated with long-term respiratory symptoms and airflow limitation, but also a number of non-respiratory symptoms and issues, um, such as lower limb muscle weakness, and well, not surprisingly, also many balance and mobility related issues. And one of these is an increased risk and incidence of falls. Um, however, there's not much known behind the mechanisms of this increased fall risk in this population. It could be, for instance, related to the muscle weakness or related to the symptoms of the disease. Um, and so for this reason, we wanted to take some first steps into examining some potential mechanisms. So our aims for this uh, initial study were to firstly examine whether or not it's feasible to use treadmill-based walking perturbations in this population at all. Um, given the respiratory symptoms and the reduced physical capacities, it could be that having people walk on the treadmill for these perturbations just simply isn't really feasible. Um, secondly, more of a technical aim to determine if uh, a method we previously developed to normalize stability based on walking speed could be used. This would help make more valid comparisons between patients with uh, uh, gait restrictions to healthy controls. And I'll give a bit more details on that shortly. Um, then the first um, aim really looking at the mechanism, we wanted to examine the initial responses to walking perturbations in COPD to determine if, if large deficits in reactive stability control might exist and might be one potential mechanism for this increased fall risk. And finally, more for our perspective of interventions to, to evaluate whether people with COPD could actually adapt and improve their responses to these perturbations with repetition. So again, just briefly, the experimental setup. Um, patients were recruited during inpatient pulmonary rehabilitation at a, uh, a rehabilitation center. At the center, they had a, a GATE real-time analysis interactive lab, or GRAIL for short. This is basically a combined setup with uh, a dual belt instrumented force plate. Uh, treadmill, um, a 10 camera motion capture system, and uh, uh, a virtual screen uh, to give some optic flow during walking. Um, we used a reduced marker set uh, based on a previous validation study that was uh, validated for uh, the margin of stability in the anterior direction, which I'll come back to shortly. Uh, before actually applying perturbations, we went through a, a protocol to familiarize the patients with the setup. So explanation, we got them set up. They had some familiarization trials starting at very slow speeds up to a maximum of 1.4 meters per second. And we then uh, did some unperturbed measurements at those same speeds. Um, and this was to enable us to calculate the stability normalized walking speed. Um, and for this, we set the margin of stability at 0.15 meters. This basically means that when we then applied the perturbations, all of the participants were starting at approximately the same stability value, even if their walking speeds were a bit different. Um, and this aids the comparisons uh, during the perturbations. Um, to look at stability, we used uh, Hoff's uh, margins of stability concept. You can see the formula here, the difference between the anterior boundary of the base of support and the extrapolated center of mass position. Uh, this being the, the position of the center of mass plus um, its velocity divided by the, uh, the eigenfrequency of the inverted pendulum. We adapted this for our reduced kinematic model, which was based on the previous uh, validation study using the trochanter markers, uh, the C7 and the hallux on the feet, and also adding the velocity of the treadmill belt uh, and you can see a schematic here where on the left side we have uh, a schematic how it might look uh, if the margin of stability is positive, where the base of support boundary exceeds the anterior position of the extrapolated center of mass. And the reverse is a negative margin of stability when the extrapolated center of mass exceeds the anterior boundary of the base of support. So our perturbation protocol, you can see some examples of the perturbation here. This was a three meter per second squared acceleration of one of the treadmill belts during the stance phase. And this causes a, a forward loss of balance. Um, in the protocol, we applied this initially the first time to the right leg, 
and then eight times consecutively to the left leg, each time with 30 to 90 seconds uh, between each. Um, and the reason for this was then to just look at the stability to a kind of novel perturbation, we could look at the results from the first perturbation to each limb. And to look at the adaptation, we looked at the change from the first to the final perturbation on the left limb. So here you can see the characteristics um, of our participants. We had 12 uh, people with COPD, 12 healthy age and gender matched controls. And you can also see the BMI was also very similar. Um, I'll leave this just for reference if people want to look back at it. But one thing to note is that in COPD, we again see the classic uh, uh, reduction in lower limb strength with the quadricep isometric, isometric peak torque based on predicted values is about 25% less than would be predicted for age. Um, so firstly, um, the results relating to feasibility, we assessed this by firstly, how many um, perturbations the people could complete before having to stop due to fatigue or breathlessness, um, and also the number of times that the participants really needed the harness support. Um, so the COPD participants completed an average of 8.2 walking perturbations before stopping. So and this was always with 30 to 90 seconds between each perturbation, so roughly on average eight minutes. Uh, 11 of the 12 completed at least five perturbations um, with only one uh, patient stopping after the fourth. We had set a feasibility criteria that we would like to see the patients do at least five because if we're looking for interventions, the fewest perturbations that we see training effects for start at around four or five. So if, if they can't manage this, then it's maybe not a feasible training option. Uh, no participants required significant harness support to prevent a fall uh, with this particular perturbation intensity. So overall, gait perturbations, at least in this format and in this uh, intensity, were feasible for the population overall. For the stability normalized walking speed, what you see on the graph here are the walking speeds that the participants walked at during the perturbations. And this was their stability normalized speed, which ideally would have produced a margin of stability of 0.15 meters. And you can see there is some variation around this, but nine of the 12 patients and 10 of the 12 controls were within one standard deviation of the target and all were within five centimeters. And this is similar results to what we've seen in young and older healthy adults in our previous studies. And we do feel that this definitely reduces the inter-individual differences in baseline stability and makes our perturbation comparisons a little more valid. For AIM-3, we wanted to look at the responses to the initial perturbation. So on the left, you see the first perturbation to the right leg. And on the right side, the first perturbation to the left leg. And you can see in the overlap in points, but also in the ANOVA results at the bottom, there were no significant differences between the COPD patients and the controls. Uh, in these initial perturbations. And if we look at the number of recovery steps to get back to within five centimeters of the baseline margin of stability, we also don't see significant differences, uh, although the controls do do this uh, with a median of one step less. So overall, we don't see a clear deficit in reactive stability control in COPD versus healthy age matched controls. For adaptability, what you see here plotted on the left is a kind of conservative approach where we analyzed the second and the fourth perturbation because the first participant stopped after the fourth. Um, and on the right is more of an intention to treat analysis where we compared the first left leg perturbation with the final left leg perturbation that each individual completed. Um, we don't see any effect of uh, ANOVA effect for the repetition in either. On the right side, we do have a significant interaction in one pairwise comparison. And you can see in the data points, there's a slight increase in the final perturbation, but overall not large effects, uh, and mostly not significant. In the recovery steps, we do see an improvement of two recovery steps by the final perturbation. But again, this wasn't significant. In this case, probably just uh, due to a lack of power. Um, just briefly to mention a few limitations, this is obviously a pilot study with a small group of patients. They are relatively mobile for this population. They had a mean uh, SPBB score of 11, and many people with COPD are already below nine. Uh, there could have been selection bi bias because people with fear or anxiety related to falls might not have volunteered to participate. Uh, and the control participants were not screened for lung function, although they self-reported that there were no uh, issues there. And as I mentioned before, the results might not generalize to other different types of perturbations. So this could be quite specific to the perturbation we used. 
So in conclusion, um, treadmill perturbations in this format were feasible in COPD, and we found that reactive stability control is largely intact. Uh, we didn't see any large differences to controls. Adaptability to the perturbations is present, but limited. So it needs to be investigated further if this really could be a, an effective intervention. And therefore, perturbation-based uh, balance assessment and training in COPD should be further investigated. If it follows the same pattern as we see in older adults, it can be a very efficient method of training uh, with relatively few sessions needed, which uh, for COPD could be uh, an advantage, but you know, the effects uh, are more limited than we see in healthy participants. So thank you very much for your attention.